The scripture text for this edition of Dr. Barnhouse and the Bible is Romans chapter 8 and verse 23. Here again is Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse with a message entitled Divine Healing. Through the Lord Jesus Christ we come unto thee our Father and our God and in the Holy Spirit. We pray thee that in this hour thou shalt bless the going forth of thy word. Wilt thou take it to many hearts in this hour? We ask these things in the name and for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We are studying today in Romans 8, in verse 23, the phrase, The Redemption of Our Body. Now the human body is a very wonderful thing. The psalmist was drawn out to cry, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. But in spite of all that anyone can do in the cause of human health, the death rate still remains one per person except for that generation which shall be alive at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, all, all believers will pass into heaven by way of the valley of the shadow of death, and their relatives will know the gloom of the graveyard, even though our sorrow is not as the sorrow of others who have no hope. The redemption of our bodies is yet future. Anything that can be done for our bodies today is, at best, a patchwork job. Now this brings us to a consideration of the various theories of so-called divine healing which have been presented by various people throughout the centuries. First of all, we must realize that God is sovereign and that there is no form of suffering that can reach a believer in Christ apart from the will of God. We recall that Satan confessed to God that a hedge had been placed around Job and that the angel of light was forced to acknowledge that he had been unable to touch God's man. This is true for every believer. One of the most comforting truths in the word of God is that nothing can touch us unless it has been carefully shaped to our needs and our capacities by our heavenly Father. There is an old phrase which is not in the Bible, but which conveys great spiritual truth. He tempers the wind to the shorn lamb. It's a phrase that has been quoted by some people as being scriptural. And though it is not in the Bible, it is certainly spiritual and correct. The idea indeed is biblical, though the words are not. God will never permit you to be tested above your capacity to overcome. A believer and an unbeliever may fall into the same set of circumstances, but the result will be entirely different. In fact, we may say that there is no conceivable set of circumstances in which an unbeliever may be found and in which he can never act in a manner that glorifies God, that is not duplicated for some true believer who will accept the circumstances as coming from a kind heavenly Father, and who will give all the glory to him in the triumph. The best that an unbeliever can do is to face adversity with a sullen stoicism. Now, it is in order to bring this difference to light that the Lord permits evil to come upon his children. For example, a child may be stricken with polio, and the anguished parent, who is not a believer in the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, may cry out, God, you can't do this to me. You can't afflict my child in this way. And the bitter cry may be followed by even more bitter recriminations against the power that has allowed this evil to touch the child. Now the same dread disease may strike another child, and the yielded believing parent will look up into the face of the heavenly father and cry, Lord, thou lovest this child even more than I do, and I accept from thine hand whatever thou dost send. Thou doest all things well. I do not understand it, Lord, and I'm, I'm grieved, but I know that thou art with me in my sufferings, and I will continue to praise and to worship thee. Thus, in the invisible war, there is glory to the Lord and a mouthful of dust for Satan and spiritual strengthening to every believer who is connected with what the world might call disaster. Now, when we understand this, we will see immediately how false is the doctrine of those who believe that all sickness originates with the devil and that, therefore, anyone who is not healed is demonstrating a lack of faith. We must face the fact that God himself wants believers to suffer sickness, accident, 
death, and every other ill that comes to any member of the human race. In the process, the reality of true faith will be manifested, not by so-called cures or healings, which can be imitated and counterfeited, but rather by a loving devotion to God and a calm acceptance of His will in suffering, which cannot be duplicated in the heart of an unbeliever. Thus the Lord is vindicated when, in the midst of a world in which Satan is the prince, and in an age when Satan is the God, it is possible to call out a people for the name of the Lord and bring them to the point where they will endure as seeing him who is invisible. Now in the light of this, we can see the error in the teaching of some who have made false statements about the measure of availability of God's power for healing today. There are men who stand before audiences and teach that any form of sickness shows that the sufferer is out of the will of God. If you have faith, says one so-called healer, you can come forward and be healed of your sickness in exactly the same way that you once came forward and were saved from your sins. There is no difference, he continues. There is no difference between the nature and power of the faith that was exercised in salvation and that which must be exercised for healing. Now, we will pass over the fact that every man who has ever taught such a false doctrine has been proven wrong by his own inevitable later sickness and ultimate death. Upon examination, it will be seen that there are two glaring errors in such teaching. The first error lies in the ignorance of the nature of saving faith. The uh, healer did not realize that saving faith is the gift of God and that God does not bestow it upon everyone. It is not something that is possessed by all men, but it is the first manifestation of the new life which God calls forth from a soul whom he has determined to save in spite of the spiritual death that binds it. Salvation is by sovereign grace. If that first consideration is accepted, then we are ready to agree that healing is a parallel gift, dependent only upon the sovereign grace of God. The second error in the equation of saving faith and healing faith is that of believing that there is something inherently wrong and sinful in bodily afflictions. It is true that death passed upon all men because that all have sinned. It is also true that the fragmentary results of spiritual death are manifested in all the ills that befall the race. But it is not true at all that blindness, for example, or an affliction of speech are sinful. Who did sin? The disciples asked Jesus. Who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered in John 9, 2 and 3, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Moses was afflicted with some impediment in his speech. When he answered God's call to service by complaining that he was of slow speech, and a twisted tongue, as the Hebrew has it, God answered, Who made man's mouth, or who made the dumb, or the deaf, or the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Exodus 4, 11. I repeat this here because it is necessary to establish this most important fact, that God planned suffering, created its nature for his purposes, and he brings his children into it, in order to complete his purposes in them. When we come to the New Testament, therefore, it is possible to discover the great change in God's methods of working. When Christ was among men, he healed all with whom he came in contact. He was God, and therefore he was life. He broke up every funeral he ever met, and when he came into a village and the people brought their sick to him, he healed them all. His miracles were not performed alone upon those who trusted in him, but he healed lepers who did not return to him and fed those who refused to believe in him spiritually, though they were ready to take him by force and make him king. He rebuked them with the statement that they had come to him only because of the loaves and the fishes. He clearly taught that if he had been present when Lazarus was sick, he would have had to have healed Lazarus and that thus Lazarus' death would not have taken place. 
In John 11, he said, Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there to the intent that ye believe. The gift of healing, like all the other gifts, was dispensed by God in order to authenticate the men who stood to preach the gospel in a day when there was no New Testament. If you had accompanied Bartholomew, for example, and watched him preach in any community, you would have heard him proclaim the truth. And instead of pointing to a text in the New Testament as the proof of the truth of his ministry, he would have performed some miracle act of healing. Today, we should not accept any testimony that was backed up by any sort of wonder, providing that the man who performed the wonder denied the word of God. If someone came into a meeting in our day and said that it was not necessary to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we would know that he was a messenger of Satan, even if he put new legs on a legless man and new eyes in the empty sockets of a blind man. The wonders which he performed we would label as lying wonders wrought with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, as God describes it in Second Thessalonians 1. The only method by which a teacher can be authenticated today is through faithfulness to the written word of God. It is conformity to the Bible that is the proof of an authentic ministry, and that conformity must be both in the doctrine that is preached and in the life that is lived. Apart from this double conformity, there can be no claim to a divinely given ministry. Next, it should be noted that in the days of the first century, there was a transition period from the authentication by miracles to the authentication by the word of God. This is why there is definite sickness reported in the Bible in three of the leading men of the New Testament. First, it should be noted that St. Paul was practically blind and that there is no suggestion that there was any relief for his blindness. If we interpret his thorn in the flesh to be his blindness, as we read in 2 Corinthians 12, 7 to 9, we are flatly told that Paul prayed for the departure of this thorn in the flesh and that God answered him that the divine strength was to be made perfect in the human weakness and therefore his prayer would not be answered. There is no suggestion that he remained unhealed because of any lack in his faith. The fact of the blindness is demonstrated in several of Paul's epistles. For example, he was forced to dictate his epistles to men who held the pen, and when they had completed their work, he scrawled the final benediction with his own hand. To the Galatians, he apologizes for scrawling with such childishly large letters as he painfully finishes the epistle. He ends his epistle to the Colossians with the line, the salutation by the hand of me, Paul. Since there were forged epistles circulating under the name of Paul, as he noted in writing his second epistle to the Thessalonians, he closes that epistle with the words, the salutation of Paul with mine own hand, which is the token in every epistle that I write. Writing to the believers in another church, he bore testimony to the fact that they were so grieved because of his near blindness that they would have plucked out their own eyes and given them unto him. Now beyond question, Paul was the leading instrument of God for the conveyance of Christian truth to the churches of his day and the channel of revelation and inspiration chosen by God to preserve and record the truth that it might be transmitted even unto us. Yet there is no suggestion that Paul did anything whatsoever to gain healing for his blindness beyond praying three times concerning it and ceasing to pray as soon as the Lord told him that divine strength would be made perfect in his human weakness. There is no record that he ever called any elders to anoint him or pray for him. There is no suggestion that his blindness was the result of any sin on his part. There is no teaching that he could have been healed if he had followed the normal human desire for healing. There was no power that he could have appropriated to alleviate his condition or bring any cure to him. There is no thought that the healing of his blindness was in the atonement provided by Christ and that such healing was to be appropriated by an act of faith. 
Secondly, it should be noted that Epaphroditus was terribly ill for months and months while living with Paul in Rome and that he was not cured, nor was any attempt made to have a cure applied to him, nor to have the church pray for his healing. The story is in the epistle to the Philippians, one of the last to be written by Paul. It came to the Philippian church from Rome, where Paul was a prisoner nearing the moment of his trial and death. The clues for our deduction are as follows. The Philippian church was the only church that sent money to support Paul in his work for the Lord, as we read in Philippians 4. That church decided to send an offering to Paul in his Roman prison, and they chose Epaphroditus as the messenger to bring the gifts to Paul. There were no banks in the days of Paul, and money could not be transmitted by check, money order, or other forms of bank credit. Paper money had not been invented. The only way for Epaphroditus to take the money to Paul was in gold or silver coins in a money belt around his own body. There were only two routes of travel. Either the messenger had to take ship, and a very small ship at that, and to go by such means of conveyance moved by oars and sail, or to go overland through the upper Balkans, entering Italy from the northeast. In either case, the journey would have occupied upwards of three months. Now it is that time element of three months which furnishes us with our clue concerning the length of Epaphroditus' illness. He reached Paul with a gift, but he was at the point of death. Paul wrote the Philippians that, For the work of Christ he was nigh unto death, not regarding your lack of service toward me. Which means that through the dangers he met on the road, he was exposed in such a manner that he was practically brought to death in his faithfulness at bringing the money to Paul. Now if there had been travelers poised in Rome and Philippi, ready for the journey to the other city, the time of Epaphroditus' illness is seen to have been a strict minimum of six months, though it was probably much longer. Epaphroditus reached Rome on the point of death. Paul made no attempt to heal him. There is no suggestion that he was prayed for or anointed. There is no thought that he was lacking in faith because he was so terribly ill. A second messenger started out for Philippi, bearing the news that Epaphroditus was sick. The news reached the Philippian church, causing them deep grief. Now if a third messenger was ready for the return journey to Rome, and if he started out immediately, he consumed another three months in the trip. He brought the news of the grief of the church over Epaphroditus' illness. It grieved Epaphroditus greatly that his home church had been saddened by his illness. Now the fourth messenger, Epaphroditus again, returns to Philippi bearing the epistle. But it is to be noted that he is sent back as a convalescent who had been sick nigh unto death. There is no suggestion of healing in his case, but rather that the mercy of God had been extended to him through a long and painful illness that left him so weak that Paul had to send him, quote, the more carefully, unquote. Now, this was the same Paul by whom God had wrought special miracles at Ephesus, and people were cured of their diseases when they were brought into contact with pieces of cloth that had come from the body of Paul. Why didn't Paul cure Epaphroditus? The answer is that the New Testament was nearing completion, and the days of the charismata, the spiritual gifts, were coming to an end. But not only was Epaphroditus a long convalescent, but we discover, finally, that Paul had learned that his own son in the faith, Timothy, had fallen ill with what today we would call chronic stomach trouble. Now, we do not know the final diagnosis of his complaint, but we do know that it was a recurring one. It is at least possible that he had the disease so common to missionaries, and that today is called amoebic dysentery. This disease comes from the amoeba transmitted in the food or more generally in the water. Timothy was not told to call the elders and be anointed. He was told to use wine, fermented wine, as a medicine for his ailment. Drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities.
Paul makes no mention of praying for him to be healed or of asking the other believers to pray for such a healing. Paul was soon to write his last epistle. The recording of the New Testament was fast coming to its completion. The end of the supernatural gifts was in sight. The normal course of the centuries in which we are still living was beginning. Thus it would continue, and thus it is continuing, until the return of the Lord Jesus Christ and the redemption of our bodies. Before we go on in our next study to consider the nature of the redeemed bodies that we shall someday possess, it is necessary for me to issue a word of warning to protect myself from those who are bitter in their defense of a theory. What I have said here must not be construed as teaching that we are not to pray when sickness comes. I pray when I have been attacked by some malady, even by a small sprain or a headache, that the Lord will relieve me if it be his will, or that he will give me the grace to support it. When one of my sons was run down by an automobile, suffering a broken leg and a fractured skull, I prayed for his healing, if it were the Lord's will, though I told the Lord that he loved my David more than I did myself, and that I did not want my son here on earth for five minutes longer than the Lord wanted him here. I will never claim a definite healing from God unless he overwhelmingly leads me to do so, because I do not generally know what the will of the Lord is for any individual. It certainly would be sin for anyone to have asked the Lord to keep Job from having boils, or to have prayed for the healing of those boils until the glory they brought to God was fully assured. Thus, it would be sin for us to do more than to ask to work out the counsel of his will in any given case. Here we tread very softly. We want the will of the Lord, and we want nothing else. Jesus himself did not pray the Father to take his own out of the world, but rather that they should be kept from the evil one in the midst of this world. If we follow this leading and do not go beyond it, we shall find ourselves in the Lord's will, and we will discover that we are being conformed to the image of God's Son. And our dear Heavenly Father, we pray thee to use the message of this hour in the hearts of many of thy people. We ask it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.